and the Deputy Prime Minister will brief you and then we'll have time for just a couple of questions. Deputy Prime Minister, dear Olga, welcome. Welcome back to the NATO headquarters. It's always a great pleasure to meet with you and uh, to have this uh, opportunity to address uh, the situation in and around Ukraine. We just uh, had a, a very uh, good meeting and then we will continue later on uh, with a meeting with all the 30 NATO allies uh, in uh, the NATO-Ukraine uh, Commission uh, later on today. Uh, we just addressed the evolving situation in and around Ukraine. Russia's military build-up continues with tens of thousands of uh, combat-ready troops armed with uh, heavy capabilities. On Friday, NATO foreign ministers called again on Russia to remove its forces uh, from Ukraine and um, from your borders. Demonstrate transparency and de-escalate. Any further aggression against Ukraine would come at a high political and economic price. NATO allies are united in their support for all nations to choose, to choose their own path. This has been a fundamental principle uh, of European security for decades. Ukraine is a um, valued and long-standing partner to NATO, and today's meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission comes at the start of an important week for European security. The United States and Russia are currently meeting in Geneva. On Wednesday, we will hold the NATO-Russia Council meeting here in Brussels, and on Thursday, the OCE will meet. Our meeting in the NATO-Ukraine Commission is a timely opportunity to exchange assessments uh, on the situation, to express um, allies' strong political and practical support to Ukraine, and to coordinate ahead of diplomatic engagements with Russia. I welcome that Russia has agreed to our offer to hold the meeting of the NATO-Russia Council later this week. This is a positive signal. We will focus on European security issues, transparency related to military activities, risk reduction and arms control. We will listen to Russia's concerns, but any meaningful dialogue must also address our concerns about Russia's actions. And it must take place in consultation with Ukraine as we are doing today. We are also consulting closely with other partners, including Georgia, Moldova, Finland, Sweden, and the European Union. So, Deputy Prime Minister, thank you again for being here today. I'm looking forward uh, to our discussions with all 30 allies in the uh, NATO-Ukraine uh, Commission. So, once again, welcome, Olga. Thank you, uh, dear Secretary General, dear ladies and gentlemen. Convening the extraordinary meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission ahead of the meeting of the NATO-Russian Council is an essential step also sharing the principle nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. I take this as a strong demonstration by the Allies of their unwavering and enduring support of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty since the beginning of the Russians' armed aggression against my country. Today, my intention is to bring the ultimate clarity to all allies about the security situation in the region and over Ukrainian borders, including implementation of the Minsk and Normandy arrangements. We should all realize that Russia's demands to allies could not be considered as a negotiating position. Aggressor is not in a position to put conditions until the Russian tanks is out of Ukrainian border. We see as Russia attempts to shift the discussion by threatening with the new war without moving any step forward peaceful settlement within Minsk and Normandy formats. What Russia is doing is tries to impose its agenda instead of returning to the negotiation table. So once again, my discussions on the security guarantees should start with the withdrawal of Russian troops from the Ukrainian territory. Uh, basically today, <coughs> Russia demands for unconditional surrender, demands 
to undermine the basic principles of functioning of the democratic countries and the principles of NATO. We believe that Russia miscalculates the situation and we strongly rely on our allies and their unity in assertiveness in protecting security and stability in Europe. Still, we would all realize the danger that is a build-up in our country. Russia will amass enough troops to launch an additional full-scale invasion into Ukraine, so we need to do everything possible to prevent that. And that's what we're going discuss, to discuss today, and I hope to see and hear the proposals from the Allies also. We also support the need to keep diplomatic channels with Russia open if that prevents a shift from military tools. The most principled position for Ukraine is that we have inherent sovereign right to choose our own security arrangements, including treaties and alliances. The Euro-Atlantic integration is enshrined in our constitution and supported by the majority of Ukrainian citizens. It's not a subject to negotiation or bargaining chip. <clears throat> we also expect that NATO would consider all the regional threats both military and hybrid, in its entirety, and will demonstrate a strong unity over addressing them ahead of the next NATO summit in Madrid. I count on allies' position that none of the <coughs> commitments within the NATO open door policy can be revised. Clarity over the next steps towards NATO aspiring countries like Ukraine will be the best investment towards setting democratic transformations in stone and the best response to any aggressor undermining the democratic values we all share. Thank you and I'm looking forward for a very fruitful meeting of the NATO Ukraine Commission. Okay. To Interfax Ukraine. Thank you, Elena. Uh, good morning. Uh, Iruna Sommer, News Agency Interfax <coughs> Ukraine. Uh, Secretary General, uh, political and uh, practical support to Ukraine is very, very important. But don't you think that time has come and as a part of deterrence NATO policy to provide to Ukraine membership action plan? Thank you. What we have stated very clearly is, uh, first of all, that we continue to provide uh, support to Ukraine. Um, political support for Ukraine's territorial uh, integrity, sovereignty, but also practical support uh, with uh, our comprehensive assistance package, with different trust funds, with uh, different activities uh, conducted by the NATO office in Kiev, where we help to implement reforms, help to modernize Ukraine's armed forces. And uh, I always encourage allies to step up and uh, also uh, provide uh, more support within the NATO uh, framework. Um, I, for instance, visited uh, Odessa some time ago, and then I saw how uh, NATO helped uh, to train and build the naval capabilities of Ukraine uh, with, uh, at the Naval Academy in uh, Odessa. We also exercise uh, uh, together, and we work together in many ways. On top of that, um, uh, we, uh, we also have many allies providing bilateral support to Ukraine uh, with training, with capacity, with uh, different types of equipment. And I encourage and welcome uh, the support NATO allies provide uh, bilaterally directly to Ukraine. And this is also, of course, sending a clear message that Ukraine has the right to defend itself. Uh, that is a enshrined right in the UN founding uh, treaty and NATO helps Ukraine to uphold the right to defend itself. Uh, on membership, we have uh, reiterated the decision we made at the Bucharest uh, summit in uh, 2008, um, and we stand by that decision. Um, uh, we help uh, Ukraine to move towards NATO membership by implementing reforms, by meeting NATO standards, and we have stated very clearly that we will never compromise on the right for every nation uh, in Europe to choose its own path, including what kind of security arrangements it wants uh, to be a part of. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, it is uh, fundamental that that principle is not violated in any uh, way, meaning that uh, it is for Ukraine and the 30 NATO allies to decide uh, when Ukraine is ready for membership. No one else has any right to say anything about that. Okay, uh, we'll go to uh, the National Agency of Ukraine. 
Uh, Dmitry Shkurkan, National News Agency of Ukraine. Secretary General, it's understandable <coughs> that today uh, you will speak uh, with Ukrainian partners about Russian so-called uh, security proposals. But taking into account that uh, all and each, every uh, NATO nation have a different uh, history and even geography of uh, relations with Russia, what is uh, the results of uh, future NRS uh, is uh, appropriate for NATO and for you personally, just to keep uh, unity of uh, the alliance? Uh, and uh, if I may, to uh, uh, Madame Stefanishina, uh, we, uh, Ukraine facing not only the military threat, but also a hybrid one. So that uh, as we saw in Kazakhstan recently, uh, the uh, internal unrest could be easily turned into the uh, external uh, military intervention. So that uh, what is uh, the Ukrainian authority doing uh, to prevent such development uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine and uh, to prevent uh, to turning it into the failed state? Thank you. Okay. I hope I understood your question, but if, if it was about the, the, the future of the NATO-Russia Council, Yes. Yeah. What, what, what result yeah. is appropriate for you? <clears throat> well, so, fundamentally, I think what we see now uh, in and around Ukraine uh, with the Russian military build-up demonstrates the relevance and the importance of NATO's dual-track approach to Russia. That we need, of course, strong deterrence and defense, but we need to combine that with a meaningful dialogue. And that's exactly what we do now. Uh, we are sitting down in Russia, we meet them, um, here in Brussels in the NATO-Russia Council. NATO allies meet them also in the OSE. And of course, we have the United States meeting with Russia in uh, Geneva. Th these are important efforts uh, to try to uh, uh, make sure that we have a political solution, that we prevent an armed conflict. And uh, therefore, we are going into these talks uh, uh, in good faith, uh, ready to address substance, and of course, ready to listen to Russia's concerns. Um, I have negotiated with Russia before uh, as a Norwegian Prime Minister and I know it's possible to make deals with Russia. Uh, and we also have seen that uh, in the wider NATO context before on arms control uh, and on other uh, areas. Um, so therefore we are, are working hard uh, for um, a peaceful political path and we are ready to continue and to work with Russia to try to uh, find that path uh, towards a peaceful uh, solution. At the same time, we need to be prepared for that uh, Russia once again uh, chooses to use uh, armed force, uh, chooses confrontation instead of uh, cooperation. And, um, and therefore, we also need to send a very clear message to Russia that we are united, uh, that there will be uh, severe costs, uh, economic, political costs uh, for Russia if they once again um, use uh, military force against Ukraine. Um, we provide support to Ukraine, helping them to uphold the right for self-defense. And, uh, of course, NATO allies, uh, is very, we are very clear on our commitment to the protect and defend uh, all uh, NATO allies. I believe that the NATO-Russia Council is an important platform um, uh, an all-weather platform for consultations, for dialogue with Russia, uh, and especially when tensions um, are high, when we see threats and challenges as we see now, it's important that we have this institution, that we use it, and that we talk. So uh, I welcome the fact, it's a good sign, a positive sign, that Russia uh, now is willing to meet in the NATO Russia Council here in Brussels on Wednesday. Thank you so much. I will start by saying that Ukraine is not Kazakhstan, definitely. And basically, the best response of Ukraine is building the internal resilience by transformations. We have, uh, op opposite to the uh, Kazakhstan, we have a vigorous uh, civil society, expert community, and also a strong opposition. And uh, we have a very strong international unity over uh, condemning the Russian aggression of a territory of Ukraine. And we are not part of any post-Soviet structures which would anyway, in such case like Kazakhstan, allow the external military intervention to its territory and capturing the critical infrastructure. So basically what we are doing is the reforming, fighting the Russian aggression in our territory and preserving the international community together by condemning uh, the illegal actions of the aggressor. 
Let, let, okay. uh, please. let me just add that, of course, I welcome a meeting that will take place today, uh, not, uh, later on this week, on Wednesday, in the NATO Russia Council. I welcome the meeting that takes place in Geneva today between uh, US and Russia, and the OC meeting later on this week. But I don't think we can expect that these meetings will solve all the issues. Uh, what we are hoping for is that we can agree uh, on the way forward, that we can agree on a series of meetings, that we can agree on the process. Uh, so it's not realistic to expect that uh, when we have um, finished this week, when we have finished uh, 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 meetings that are already scheduled, that uh, the problems will be solved. But I really hope that uh, there is a, a real will on both uh, uh, sides, including on the Russian side, it is on the NATO side, uh, to, to engage in a process that can um, uh, prevent a, a new armed conflict in Europe. And therefore, uh, we are uh, aiming for an agreement on a way forward, a process, uh, a series of meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes this press point. Thank you.